Welcome back to part two in our series covering the installation of our Vantage Pro 2 Plus wireless weather station. In this episode, we will walk through the installation process. We will cover site selection and prep, mounting of our ISS and remote sensors, and communication testing between our console, remote sensors, and ISS. Now we've got a lot to cover in this episode, so sit back and let's get started. Before we go any further, let's stop and talk about safety. Safety is priority above everything else. Always be aware of your surroundings, such as power lines. And if at any point during your installation you feel unsafe, stop and seek the necessary professional help. When I was a kid, I used to watch the New Yankee Workshop. And one of the things Norm Abrams always started off his segments with was a speech about safety. And one of the things he always said was, there's no more important safety rule and to wear these safety glasses. So anytime you're using power tools, be sure to wear these. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's continue on with our install. Site selection is a critical component that should not be overlooked. Now we want the most accurate readings possible from our station and where we place the weather station will have a significant impact on its accuracy. When selecting a site, here are a few points to consider. First, Place the ISS away from any external source of heat, such as an exhaust vent or air conditioner. Next, place the ISS at least 100 feet away from any asphalt or concrete roadways. Also avoid objects that could absorb and re-radiate heat, such as buildings. Ideally, place the radiation shield 5 feet above gently sloping or flat ground that is well drained. Also ensure that the area is going to be regularly mowed or that it is naturally landscaped. Avoid installation near a sprinkler system. Now this should go without saying, but mounting near a sprinkler is going to affect your precipitation readings. Don't locate the ISS under a tree canopy or near structures that can create rain shadows. And finally, if you are utilizing solar or UV radiation sensors, ensure that the ISS is in a location that is exposed to the sun all day. I live in a rural area, so I have several potential sites to choose from. Now, I took our drone up to give you a better idea of our site selection process. Now, the very front and the side areas of our property have a decent slope, so I've opted to avoid these areas. The area just in front of our house would be fine, but I've chosen not to place the station here just for aesthetic reasons. Now, our original station is mounted on the back of our property near the garden, and we'll be installing the new station here as well. This area was a good selection as it was level, regularly mowed, receives full sun, and is free from any obstructions or other environmental variables that would have affected station readings. Now every installation will be different, and so the list of materials and tools necessary for the job will vary from install to install. Here's a list of the materials and tools that I use for our install. One bag of ready mix concrete. Now the concrete is optional, but I chose to use it for our install to add more stability to the mounting pole. This ran around $4. Next is the mounting pole itself. Now I used a 10 foot section of inch and a half EMT conduit. It's possible to use a smaller size. I'd say the inch and a quarter would work, but I used the larger size for more strength. Now this conduit has an outside diameter of about an inch and three quarters, and the U-bolts provided by Davis will work just fine. I was able to purchase the conduit for just over $20. Now, finally, I purchased two lag bolts for the install. Now, these are very inexpensive, and for the two, didn't even amount to a dollar. Now, we'll get into my reasoning for this a little bit later, but these are optional purchases as well. As for the tools you'll need for a project, again, this will vary from install to install, but here are the list of tools that I use. Now, a pulse hole digger. Now, obviously, this is used to dig the hole for the mounting pole, but if you have access to a tractor with a pulsed hole digger or an auger of some kind, more power to you. Next, I used a garden hoe. Now, I use this for tamping the dirt tightly around the pole and for final cleanup after the hole is filled back in. Next is a tape measure. Now you'll use this a couple times for checking the depth of the hole and later for ensuring that the ISS is mounted at the right height. Next, you're gonna need a level. 
And of course, this is for ensuring that the mounting pole is straight up and down. Lastly, if you opt to use the lag bolts for your install, you will need a drill and the appropriate drill bit. Now I used a smaller one for the pilot hole and a larger one that was the actual size of the lag bolts. I finished digging the hole for the mounting pole. It's good practice to set about a third of a pole's overall length in the ground. Given that our mounting pole is 10 feet in length, you can see that I've dug the hole to a depth of about 3 feet. I am marking the pole at 20 inches. Here I will begin drilling the holes that I will use to insert the lag bolts. Now the holes will be offset slightly so they won't interfere with each other. The lag bolts will be in concrete and will offer more stability to the mounting pole, not allowing it to twist as easily. With the hole and mounting pole now prepped, it's time to set the pole into the ground. You'll notice that I've placed the mounting pole into the ground and packed several inches of dirt around it to offer stability while I continue to add dirt and eventually the concrete. You'll want to check the pole multiple times to ensure that it's level throughout this entire process. A final note about the concrete. You'll notice that I didn't pre-mix the concrete and then pour it into the hole. I simply added the dry mix and water and mixed it while it was in the ground. Now that I have filled in the hole, I've raked up the remaining dirt that was left over and mounted it at the bottom of the pole. With a final compacting of the dirt, the pole is now solid enough that we can install our new ISS. There are a couple things that we need to do to our ISS in order to prepare it for normal operation. Now these tasks are simpler to do while we can get to it, so let's take care of them before we install the unit onto the pole. We're going to start by removing the sticker and then we will remove the ring collector. You can see the plastic tie that was used to hold the tipping spoon in place during shipping. Now I'm just going to use wire cutters to snip the tie and then we'll be able to remove it easily. Finally, we will remove the two clear plastic strips that were preventing our fan batteries from discharging during shipping. Just pull on these and they will remove easily. The tool list that you'll need to install the new ISS is pretty small. You will need a 7 16 open end wrench. Now this will be used to tighten down the nuts on the provided U-bolts that will hold the station in place. Next is a Phillips screwdriver. Now, I believe this is a number two Phillips, and this is going to be used to tighten down the mounting screws for the UV and solar radiation sensor. 
Lastly, you'll more than likely need a ladder to at least level out the radiation sensors. Now, I didn't use one to mount the ISS, but unless you're at least six foot four like me, you'll more than likely need one. To begin mounting the ISS, you will need to hold the unit in place while inserting the provided U-bolt through the two holes in the ISS from the back of the unit. Once you have the U-bolt inserted, place the metal plate over the two ends that are visible from the front of the unit. Also, put the washers in place and then you can start the nuts onto the threads. Now you can definitely mount the ISS by yourself, but it's just a little bit awkward holding it in place while you get the nuts started and tighten it down. If you have the option of having someone help you, I would recommend it. I've placed the ISS in approximately the right place and tightened down the nuts just enough to hold it in place. Now you'll want to make sure that the station is pointed toward the south so that the solar panels can absorb as much sun as possible. Now once the ISS is oriented in the right direction and the bottom of the radiation shield is 5 feet from the ground, tighten the bolts down all the way so that the station is securely fashioned. I do want to caution you against putting Herculean effort into this. Now keep in mind that the mounting bracket is plastic and you don't want to damage it. Tighten the bolts down just enough so that the station is secure and that it will not move. When you step up to the Vantage Pro 2 Plus series of weather stations, the UV and solar radiation sensors are included. These sensors are located on the top of the sensor mounting shelf just forward of the rain collector. Now each sensor is mounted on a spring-loaded mount and requires leveling. If we take a closer look, you can see the leveling bubble is built into the sensor housing to assist with this. Both sensors have one of these bubbles and you will be required to level each one separately. The leveling process may seem a little awkward when you first begin, but you'll get the hang of it rather quickly. Now the goal is to get the bubble centered within the black circle. Here's a tip. Look at the bubble and see which mounting screw that it is closest to, and then tighten that screw until it moves as close to the center as possible. Repeat that process until the bubble is dead center of the black circle. As long as you took care of making sure the entire ISS was level when it was mounted, this process should not take too much time. 
It was a little awkward to align our sensors while shooting a video of it, but I wanted to show you what the process looked like. Now I've sped up the video so you don't have to watch it in real time. Now that the sensors are in line, we can reinstall the rain collector. We are nearly finished installing the ISS. Now there's only a couple things left for us to do. Let's start by removing the front cover. We need to pull the tab from the battery for normal operation. This tab was put in place to keep the battery from draining during shipping. I also want to talk about setting the dip switches for the transmitter ID. If this is your only weather station, none of this will apply to you and the default settings will suit you just fine. If you have another weather station operating, like I do for the moment, you'll need to change the transmitter ID. Now this can be done by setting the dip switches. These switches are located at the top right corner of the board, just to the right of the battery. I will change our new ISS to use ID code 2 by flipping the number 3 switch to the on position. Now you can refer to the install guide for full details on possible ID settings. With that done, we can reinstall the cover to complete our ISS install. You have several options when it comes to mounting your anemometer, and some are definitely easier than others. Now, out of the box, Davis provides you with a 40-foot cable for your anemometer. According to the user manual, this can be extended to 540 feet using optional extension cables. Let's start with some basic mounting options. You can mount the anemometer on the same pole as the ISS. When I first got my station, this is the route that I took. At the time, I didn't have many other options. For this type of mounting, the anemometer should be a minimum of 12 inches above the rain collector. Now you probably already noticed, but on my original installation, my anemometer did not quite meet this requirement. Now lastly, another type of installation that I would consider to be easy is for agricultural applications. For this type of install, the anemometer should be 6 feet above the ground. For a new installation, I wanted to mount my anemometer to adhere to standards for meteorological applications. Because of this requirement, this install is going to be more difficult. I thought about my options and I had come up with two. The first was to mount the anemometer on the peak of my garage. Now the height would have been right, but I'd have had to use an extension ladder and working at that height made me nervous. So instantly went to option two. Option two was mounting the sensor on the chimney of our house. I really thought that getting my wife on board for this was going to be near impossible. I seriously don't know why but she let me do it. Mounting on the chimney gave me the height I needed, which was 33 feet above the ground. Going back to the user manual, it twice mentions that the anemometer should be at least seven feet above any obstacle. Now our install does meet that requirement, but mounting on the chimney, I did have to purchase additional mounting hardware and equipment, which we'll cover next. Given our mounting requirements, I had to purchase additional mounting hardware. I found exactly what I needed on Amazon. I purchased a stable mounting kit and two mast extensions. This added a little over $100 to the project cost, but it was exactly what I was looking for. 
Now there's some assembly required, but if you follow the instructions, the mounting bracket goes together pretty easy. To attach the mast extensions, I used two concrete blocks as a backer and tapped the pipes into place. Notice that I didn't hit the pipe directly as this could damage the end of the pipe. I placed a piece of OSB against the pipe and hit the OSB. Now it's time to assemble the anemometer itself. Attach the anemometer arm to the mounting base, making sure to slide the cable through the notch on the bracket. Then insert the machine screw through the bracket and slide on the lock washer. Then start the nut by hand and tighten it as much as you can. Finish tightening the nut using a Phillips screwdriver and needle nose pliers. Next you will need to install the wind cups. Simply slide the cups onto the shaft and use the supplied allen wrench to tighten the set screw. Be careful not to tighten this too much. I tried to be careful with this and the wrench still stripped out the head of the set screw. So watch it. Now let's attach our anemometer to our mounting pole. I've already loosely attached the sensor to the very top of the pole using the hardware included with our station. Now looking at the video later, I did neglect to put the lock washers on the U-bolt, but this will still hold just fine. Always start the nuts by hand and finish tightening them with a wrench. Next, we need to run the sensor wire down the pole to our remote transmitter. I always straighten the cable and strap it down tight. Now, this is not a standard install, so there were not enough cable ties included, so I just used some standard 8 inch ties that I had laying around the garage. Gunther just has to be in the middle of everything, and I do enjoy having him around.
Now it's time to mount the remote transmitter. I've had this thing long enough and I can't even remember if they came with the U-bolts or not. So I'm using two U-bolts that I already had that are the same size as the ones provided with the station. We will mount this as low as we can, just above the top mounting bracket. Before we complete the installation of our anemometer, it's important that we test our sensor. I don't know about you, but I'd much rather do my testing on the ground than after it's already mounted and I have to do it while I'm standing on the roof. I purchased a pack of 3 volt Duracell batteries a while back, so we'll put one of these in our transmitter. This is another point where we're going to vary off of the standard installation process. Remember that we're going to be running three different pieces of equipment that are transmitting. Our original station that's going to be using ID1 and our new station that's going to be using ID2. Our remote transmitter will need its own channel, so we will configure it for ID3. This is the same table that is in your user manual, but I wanted to make sure we included it in this video as well. Now to set our transmitter to use ID3, we're going to flip the number 2 dip switch to the on position. This is such a rookie mistake, I almost didn't put it in the video. Do you notice anything about the battery? Yep, I put it in backwards. So let's get this out of there and put it in correctly. Now the original video that we took showing the configuration of the console for testing our remote transmitter didn't come out well. So I want to go through this again because I believe it's important that you see this and that way you'll know how to do this for yourself. Now all this is stepped through in the console user manual, but we're going to go through this now. We've got our console. I'm going to plug it into a remote power source. No sense of using batteries on this since we're just testing right now. Now the console is going to go through and initialize itself. We're waiting for it to come up and say receiving from at the bottom. This takes about 10 seconds to go through the process. Now that we're on receiving from, I'm going to hit done, and that's going to get us into the setup for the console. Now we're on ID transmitter 1, that shows on for ISS. We need to turn that off because this is going to be, this is the ID that our original ISS is using. So I'm going to hit the down, or the down button, which is the minus sign, and that's going to turn it off. We're going to hit the right button, and that's going to get us to ID 2. Now it shows off. I'm going to hit the up arrow or the plus button. That turns it on and it says that it's an ISS. This is correct. So we're going to hit the right arrow one more time. Now we're on ID3 and you see that it says it's off. So we're going to turn this on. Now it says it's an ISS. Now this is incorrect because we're hooking up a wind sensor. So we're going to hit the graph button and that's going to scroll through the possible sensors and we're going to stop on wind. Now that this is set up we're going to press and hold done until the weather data screen comes up. Now where I'm filming my videos is in, in my garage and with the metal roof and sides, we're not going to get a lot of data on here so I'm not surprised that we're not receiving. But this is what I did when we were setting up our console just for testing. Okay, so let's go spin those cups again. And we have data. The final part of the video was going to cover the mounting of the anemometer on our chimney. But as I was carrying the tools up onto the roof and prep for the job, I decided no, that's just crazy. There's too much going on and I don't need to be messing with the camera and the tripod. So I will tell you how I installed it. I marked the holes for the mounting brackets and pre-drilled the holes. I then secured the mast to the chimney using Tapcon screws. I'll leave you with these final images of the completed install. Hey, thank you for sticking around to watch the second video in our series covering the replacement of our Vantage Pro 2 Plus wireless weather station. If you have any comments or questions concerning our installation, please feel free to leave them in the comments section below. Now in the final episode, we're going to cover the configuration of the console, and I'll give you a first-hand look at the software that I use to manage my weather data. Now if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to click the like and subscribe button below. Be sure to stick around for the next video. And as always, thanks for watching.